I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about serotonin syndrome. Do I need to be afraid of it? So the take-home message is if you're on an antidepressant, you've probably gotten notices from the pharmacy or seen black box warnings that you're at risk for serotonin syndrome, which is an excess of serotonin at the synaptic level. And it can be a potentially serious, even lethal condition. There are lots and lots of people on serotonergic antidepressants in this country. Probably more than 10% of the U.S. population or close to that's on an SSRI and another three, four, five percent are on other antidepressants, many of which also enter with serotonin. Even though this is a spectrum and there are certainly milder forms of it, serious case of serotonin syndrome, even if you are on multiple drugs affecting the serotonin system, are quite uncommon. Yes, be cautious if you have sensitivity to medications. Yes, be aware of what some of the symptoms are, which I will get to. Seldom should be a reason to avoid medications which may otherwise be appropriate. So why am I talking about this now? We've known the existence of serotonin syndrome for at least 30, 40 years. Though lots of doctors outside of psychiatry are less familiar with it, attention to it has been growing thanks to black box warnings from others. Some speculation that even though people may identify the existence of serotonin as a specific neurochemical in the last century, maybe ergot poisoning when ergot's a fungus that grows particularly on rye and some other grains and cause both hallucinations and muscle spasms and syndromes that probably look like serotonin syndrome. Clinics actually dedicated to this in the Middle Ages run by monks, so more than a thousand years ago. So probably serotonin syndrome's been with us for a while, even if we're only recognizing now. So yes, we should be aware of it. Yes, we should learn more about it. And no, I think in many cases, we're overreacting. So why I'm talking about it now, there's an antibiotic, lenazolide, very effective against a host of gram-positive organisms that can cause pneumonia, skin conditions, bacteremia, bacteria in your blood. So it's often a, a good step-down antibiotic if you've needed antibiotics IV in the hospital. But it does have some monoamine oxidase inhibitor action. And it's been a black box warning since 2020 that you should not take this if you are taking an SSRI or most other antidepressants. And a black box warning doesn't mean the doctor is breaking the law. Black box warning is just a strong, strong suggestion that there's a potential for interaction. Most severe action the FDA can take short of actually banning or recalling a product. It isn't ruling out that there may not be good reasons to violate the black box warning. Clearly, a variety of studies have shown when a drug has a black box warning, doctors are less willing to prescribe it, whether that's appropriately less willing or inappropriately, and does hurt sales of those drugs. Probably not used nearly as widely or extensively as it could or should have, and that means probably some people have died from infections. Canadian group did a study that had more than a thousand people who were on lenazolide and looked at those who were on an SSRI at the same time versus those who weren't, not just an elderly, but a sick and elderly population. I think everyone is over 65, at least over 60, and on an antibiotic for a serious infection. The rate of serotonin syndrome was less than half a percent. And when they crunched the numbers, actually being on an antidepressant while you were on lenazolide, you actually had a lower chance of developing serotonin syndrome than not being on an antidepressant. This group and commentary by others who were not involved in the study, but seeing the data were saying, we probably should remove that black box warning from the last night it's not here that this is a clinically common or serious, likely to be serious interaction. So jumping more to serotonin syndrome, what it is. Start with the basics of serotonin. It's one of our endolamine neurotransmitters. It's made from amino acid tryptophan, tryptophan dehydroxylase in two chemical steps, modifies tryptophan to hydroxytryptamine. So we hear about serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine all the time, yet all of these or each of these systems is a tiny, tiny numerically. Each of them is less than 1% of the neuron 
in the brain primarily use it as a neurotransmitter. Rather than thinking of serotonin as a a neurochemical that does something, thinking of it as something that modulates lots of systems, including emotion, including lots of aspects of the gastrointestinal system, the sexual response system. So that's why monkeying with serotonin can have lots of different effects throughout the body. So with serotonin, we have 14 different types of serotonin receptors. Serotonin syndrome is thought to be, again, when there's way too much serotonin in that synaptic cleft acting on serotonin 1A and 2A postsynaptic receptors. So those are the downstream ones. How or why would you get too much serotonin in the cleft? So one possibility is if you're making way too much serotonin, that's kind of hard to do. But if you took massive overdoses of tryptophan and it was getting into your bloodstream, that could be one contributory actor in and of itself. It's not likely, again, to boost serotonin to toxic levels. You could block the breakdown of serotonin. So usually serotonin is taken back up into the cell that released it. That's, I'll get to in a moment, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. But also there are chemicals, specifically monoamine oxidase, that breaks the serotonin into 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid and deactivates it. So we have specific antidepressants that are monoamine oxidase inhibitors and some other things like herbal medication St. John's wort has some MAOI, monoamine oxidase action, as does, again, some other drugs that you wouldn't think of on the surface, like linezolide, which is an antibiotic, have some MAO action. So there's certain drugs that cause the presynaptic neuro to release extra boluses of neurochemicals. So things like amphetamine and particularly MDMA dextromethorphan, which is in cough syrup, and that's also in the newly released fast-acting antidepressant allality. All of those have some potential for contributing to serotonin syndrome because they're causing a greater release into the synaptic cloud. We have some drugs that are serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, so duloxetine, which is Cymbalto, then lafaxine, which is Effexor. Some of the older tricyclic antidepressants have good serotonin reuptake action, particularly clomipramine and imipramine. P450 inhibitor, so P450 are a class of enzymes in the liver that chew up and break down drugs. There's been a few cases of bupropion, wellbutrin, also sold as Zyban, primarily thought of as a dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Pretty weak action on serotonin, but bupropion's a pretty good inhibitor of the 2D6 version of P450, and the 2D6 is the version that breaks down several of the SSRIs, so the bupropion in combination of them could boost serotonin in the cleft. And actually, when bupropion is combined with dextromethorphan in the form of allability, it's there specifically to make the dextromethorphan last longer, and again, that can boost serotonin in the cleft. Some of the opioids have been implicated in serotonin syndrome, particularly tramadol, methadone. What is serotonin syndrome? And some would actually strongly prefer the term serotonin toxicity. It emphasizes that this occurs on a spectrum. If levels are boost so much, you may have milder aspects of, and there's three different areas that affects the body. So the first is altered mental status, usually anxiety, agitation, confusion, and at the mild end, that might actually look like the condition they're treating. About a quarter of people starting on a standard dose of an SSRI feel a little more physically agitated, a little more anxious, sometimes even confused. And that's probably at the mild end of serotonin toxicity. It can be full-blown paranoia and not just mild anxiety. It can be complete disorientation and extreme confusion. The autonomic nervous system symptoms, and again, these occur on a spectrum as well, but it's being sweaty, increased heart rate, increased temperature, increased blood pressure, vomiting, diarrhea. Third set of symptoms for serotonin syndrome is neuromuscular hyperactivity. So rigidity, spasming, myoclonus is a fancy word for it and hyperreflexes. So most cases of serotonin syndrome are mild. Most of them show up pretty rapidly within 24 hours of starting or adding on a new serotonin drug, although some cases can take a few days later, at least in one study. Ramped up to a high enough level, seizures can occur, breakdown of muscle tissue, which is rhabdomyolysis, can cause renal failure, 
respiratory distress, internal bleeding, and then there certainly have been deaths associated with serotonin syndrome. So all of these together are a clinical condition. You can do lab tests, which lab tests confirms that your blood pressure is elevated. That is a form of lab test, but we do not have any specific lab tests that confirms or disconfirms serotonin syndrome. Several different approaches. The most recent one that's most favored by experts is called the Hunter Serotonin Toxic Criteria. One particular condition this can be confused with, particularly in the psychiatric population, is NMS or neural leptic malignant syndrome. So that's due to dopamine block eight. But in contrast to the serotonin syndrome, bowel activity is usually shut down or slowed down. Even though there might be rigidity, it's hypoactive muscles in NMS. Often takes several days to develop after a change in meditation. Again, where most of the time serotonin syndrome happens quickly. Often seen pharmacist warning patients is, oh, if you're adding trazodone for sleep in a low dose on your SSI, you shouldn't do that. That's going to cause serotonin syndrome. Or if you're adding buspirone, fact of the matter is the vast majority of people on trazodone, since it's been around for 40 plus years, are taking trazodone in conjunction with another antidepressant. The vast majority of trazodone use is not as an antidepressant itself. That's what it's FDA approved for. It's most commonly used to aid in sleep. Usually it doses below full antidepressant dose. The vast majority of the time, trazodone is prescribed and prescribed safely with an SSRI or with another medication. Similarly, buspirone, FDA approved use is for anxiety, but we also know that it is an effective agent for boosting the efficacy of antidepressants. So my estimations from Looking at the figures and what I've seen clinically, at least half the time buspirone is prescribed, it's being prescribed on someone who's already on another agent. Put some of this in perspective, again, about 10% of Americans are in an SSRI. In the most recent year, I could find data, 2021, poison control centers identified 90 cases of people dying from serotonin reuptake inhibitors, maybe another 80 cases of individuals on other antidepressants, which also can affect serotonin. The vast majority, more than 90% from what I couldn't look at, were intentional overdoses of massive amounts, taking a month more's worth of medication. So in this regard, we know the SSRIs are at least an order, maybe two orders of magnitude safer than the old tricyclics, where often 10 days to a month of medication, a month of most tricyclic medications would be lethal. 170 Americans died from SSRIs in 2021. Again, most of those intentional overdose suicide attempts were completed suicides. Put that in perspective, at least 202 people died from deer killing them in this country in 2020. Some of the excessive warnings are crying wolf rather than putting it more in perspective that this is likely to be less harmless than a deer is. 